shock that walked in here for those of you who coming from previous years. The old Walder was iconic. I miss that. But anyway, I'm Jerry Armando, President and CEO of the Clearinghouse. And on behalf of the TCH and the Bank Policy Institute, it's my real pleasure to see you back uh, in two years since our last one. And, and uh, suffice to say, it's so great to see people in person. I'm so tired of this virtual reality world we were in for years. So, and, and I guess based on, uh, we are actually oversubscribed to this event, so uh, I imagine everybody has the same view I do. It's just nice to actually see real people. Um, this is the 10th annual conference that we've held over the years with a two-year hiatus uh, for 2020-21. And uh, we're really glad to continue to the tradition of delivering thoughtful dialogue focused on the issues, the opportunities, and the challenges facing the country's large commercial banks. As in previous years, we'll do about 20 panel sessions populated by industry executives, government officials, thought leaders, along with keynote remarks by leading policymakers. Beyond our attendees, let me extend a special thanks in advance to our hundred some panelists for sharing your expertise, your perspective, and your very unique viewpoints. And special thanks to all of our conference partners who make this gathering possible. From TCH's perspective, our ongoing work is the tradition of the organization's long-held mis mission to deliver innovative, leading, and reliable payments infrastructure for the US financial system. On this note, let me take this opportunity to highlight that next year, the Clearinghouse will be celebrating its 170th year since our founding here in New York City in 1853. We're one of the oldest companies in New York and in America. We've been running payment systems before the Civil War, through the two world wars, the Great Depression, 9-11, and now what I'll call the Great Pandemic, uh, always headquartered in New York City. It's also worth noting that in 1913, uh, we also helped stand up the Federal Reserve. Uh, we've been pleased to be lending them the benefit of our expertise ever since, and this includes in the real-time payment space where, uh, to quote Oscar Wilde, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> By the way, you may have heard that the Fed has announced that they're launching their real-time payment system in mid-2023. Of course, we, all, we launched ours in late 2017. And today we have reached to about 85% of the DDAs across this country. Um, and soon we're gonna be launching a pilot connecting our real-time payment system with the European real-time payment system, soon to be followed by every other real-time payment system around the globe. I think this is truly a uh, landmark milestone in the payments industry. Think about it, being able to send payments instantly anywhere around the globe. Um, with that, let me again thank you for, for coming to our conference and being a part of it. It wouldn't be anything without all of your participation. And it's just really great to see people in real life. So let me turn it over to my partner, Greg Baer, from BPI for, for his introductory remarks uh, prior to our first panel of the day. Thank you. Good to see you all. It's been a while. I was thinking about just how much has happened since our last conference. Um, everybody got a dog. Um, many of you live in Florida. Um, the rest of you are on Zillow thinking about living in Florida. Uh, used cars now cost more than new cars. Uh, Instead of how are you, we now say what are you streaming? Um, which I have to mention because I finished Pine Gap last night. Awesome. <laughs> so check that out on Netflix. Um, on, in the policy world, uh, the Fed got much, much bigger. Uh, crypto got much, much bigger. And then just moderately bigger. Private capital markets and hedge funds got much, much bigger. Uh, and bank regulators focused on making banks smaller. Um, Everywhere I go, smells like weed now. Um, 
Uh, I, on the happy front, I went to breakfast this morning at 61st and Madison, forgot my wallet, paid with Zelle, increasingly powered by RTP. Uh, in 2019, when we last did this, my primary rooting interests were Carolina basketball, Baltimore Ravens, Washington Nationals. Now it's Ukrainian Army, Ukrainian Navy, Carolina basketball. Everybody got another dog. Um, many of you stay home with your dogs. Um, I should know BPI, we're four days a week in the office because I'm an office monster. Uh, I should also note apropos of Jim's remark, that we'll be celebrating our fourth anniversary this year. Um, I'd also note, just sort of on the regulatory front, and looking towards, uh, I think they headed up earlier what was coming, this preview of coming attractions, the things are sufficiently bleak for our industry that our speakers tonight are going to be an economist who talks about sports and a comedian who just got out of rehab. Um, so that's really about it. Uh, it's really, really good to see all of you again. I, I have half of mine just to suggest to Jim we just cancel all the panels and just hang out together, because uh, I think there's a lot of that going on already. Um, but I think we actually have great panels, starting with the first one. Um, I should also note one programming note Dan told me to mention is that there's now a Q&A function. If you want to have a question asked, you do that on your device. I'm sure there's some way to do that. Uh, but to our first panel, I'm going to let Mitch do the introductions. But um, I think this panel was actually my idea a long time ago. It's still my favorite panel, because I always think as we get together to talk about regulation, it helps to start with a reality check. Um, you know, that we actually do have a successful industry, we are making some money. Uh, but a lot of questions about where is that money being made, how is it being made, who's making it, what's your optimal bank size, things like that. Um, and the, the group of people we put together to talk about this is unparalleled. So um, I'll be listening intently and I hope you will as well. And just mostly, thanks for coming. So I should have said at the beginning, I'm Mitch Itell, I'm a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell, 
To my left is Gene Ludwig, who has been in almost everything in, the, in or around the banking and financial services industry in his time. He's been a regulator, a bank executive, a consultant, an investor. Uh, Tom Michaud is next to him. Tom is the CEO of Keep Briette and Woods. Ryan Nash from Goldman Sachs, a bank analyst. Uh, Jeremiah Norton, who is, uh, has been a banker in his time, an investment banker, a regulator, and now a consultant. Uh, he's the CEO of Chainbridge. And Betsy Grassick, who you've been on this panel before, but it's been a while and we're thrilled to have you back, uh, is an analyst at Morgan Stanley. And we were going to dive right in and start with the analyst uh, uh, pairing, um, as we typically do for those of you who have seen the panel before. Um, in sort of setting the, 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 the playing field. You know, Greg mentioned it's been so long since we've been together, the whole industry has changed, the whole world has changed. I had a whole list of things, right? Crypto, sanctions, Ukraine, et cetera, that I was gonna start, but you know, as I told you, Greg already went through it with much more humor than I could ever muster. Um, I, didn't hit, I didn't have pandemic puppies, though, on my, on my list. But let's just start, like, you know, Betsy and Ryan, you know, with your thoughts about sort of after all of this, after everything the banking industry has been through along with the rest of the world, what does the picture look like today? What's the financial position? What does the operating environment for the banking industry look like? I'll let you pick whoever wants okay. to begin. All right, uh, so I'll kick off. Um, Brian, you can fix what I miss. <laughs> In addition to adding everything you know. Um, Look, I guess I would say that on the surface, everything looks good, right? We've got loan growth that is in double digits again. I mean, that's fantastic. I know, I don't know if I'm the only one in the room who's been um, frustrated with low singles, so I like the double digits. Um, you've got rates rising. Again, another one of those we would love to have that happen as soon as possible for many decades. Um, and you've got credit deterioration that is hard to find. I mean, obviously there are pockets, um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, a lot of concern as opposed to data points. But I think what that belies is challenges that are looming. Um, because, you know, just to be specific, the ROE's ROA's look like they're moving in the right direction right now. But where are the challenges coming from? Well, rising rates is a double-edged sword. You've got that deposit beta moving up into the right fast. We've been saying for quite some time that we've been expecting deposit beta as a cycle are going to be higher, sharper, faster than pr prior cycles. Um, I've gotten a lot of flack and pushback on that, so feel free to start loading your questions into your iPads right now. Um, you've got liquidity that's under pressure, right? QT is a drain of liquidity, and so that's pressuring the system. You've got capital that's tight from a variety of reasons. You know, part of it is a regulatory ask, part of it is you know, a function of what's been happening just in the markets generally. And I know that TC to TA might be a four letter word that you don't want to talk about, but um, it is something that we have to address as bank analysts. And so capital is tight and you've got expenses accelerating. So while the surface looks good, there's a lot rolling underneath. And um, I, I kind of simplify it by saying that, look, inflation is a capital call loan growth's up, you've got QT that's draining liquidity, that's putting grit into the system, and this inflation overlay is really something that, um, you know, as a bank analyst for the last three decades, I've never had to deal with before. Um, it is an environment that is the toughest to forecast in my career. And I think that's part of why we see the stock valuations where we already talk about that later if you want, but in addition, um, what we kind of conclude is, wow, you really do want to have a little more excess liquidity and excess capital than the current financial picture suggests you need. <laughs> so, at least I know that I prepared properly because I listened to what Betsy had said and you know, the three bullet points that I was going to highlight was the fact that we're hitting double digit loan growth, interest rates are rising, and credit costs are, are still benign, um, which were, you know, are obviously the three big topic points across the industry. I guess the things that I would add to this is, you know, to, to pick up some of them. You know, one, we definitely are seeing some credit normalization. 
on the, on the surface, and it's really in the lower end of the consumer, right? The markets about three to six months ago became really focused on what was happening in the low end consumer. It was really a part of the consumer market that I don't think the banking industry really generally lends to as much, but we've definitely started to see cracks, and I think sticking with the theme that Betsy said, I'll talk a little bit about range of outcomes. The market is still worried about what could the overall range of outcomes be if we were to head into a downturn. Two, interest rates rising. Clearly, that is a big benefit, but you know, I could you know, think about it. If you think about the investor community out there, you know, if you have to have been investing for over 20 years to have seen a, a true rising rate cycle, right? So if you remember the last rising rate cycle, it was really low and slow. We got a hike every quarter or two. Banks were really able to lag. But we've already seen pockets of rates rising at a faster pace. If you look in the in what we'll call the online digital space, consumers are much more savvy right now. We've seen, if you look back last cycle, deposit betas in online banking. We're in the, let's call it 40 to 50% range. Betsy talked about her view. We've kind of been of the same view that online deposit costs are going to rise faster. They're kind of running in this 60% range. And, you know, I, I think the last thing to kind of take a step back, I think one of the biggest things the market is really struggling with is what, what are the range of outcomes we're going to see? And, you know, one of the things that we've really tried to do as a team is try to give the market color in terms of how the market's thinking about the environment. What is the market pricing in? And I will tell you, this is definitely much more art than science, but if you think about it, at the peak, or like you should say at the bottom, we thought the market was probably pricing in about a 60 to 70% probability of some sort of recession. Now we can define what a recession really looks like, you know, how deep, how shallow. You know, we think that number is probably closer to, to 40 to 50 today, but I think to bring it all together, I think the market is struggling right now to say, where are we going to be if you look out 18 to 24 months? And the, you know, the last one I'd say is, you know, clearly the markets were early in sniffing this out in terms of, if you think back to prior rate cycles, we would see bank stock prices peak really somewhere in, let's call it the middle of the cycle, as the market determined that we'll call the second derivative was starting to move in the opposite direction. This is the first rate cycle you know, that I've lived through or studied where bank stocks actually peaked before we actually saw the first rate rise. So I'm going to put a marker down because I'm going to want to come back to a number of things you both said. But you know, Tom, you also see you know these questions operating environment from a slightly different direction than the analysts at the table. Because you know, you in your role talking to investors and CEOs and, and CFOs, and maybe you have some perspectives on the market. I think that Betsy and Ryan hit the nail on the head. Just some of my perspective is this net interest income growth is really amongst the highest I've seen in my 37 years of paying attention. It's roughly 20%. Just, but how you benefit from that overall as a corporation depends upon what your business mix is. So Bank America, for example, we think they're gonna have 20% net interest income growth this year, but only 4% overall revenue growth because there are non-interest income businesses that kind of feel like they're in a recession. If you're in the capital raising business today, those markets for equity have essentially been closed. So some parts of the, of the model for, for the universal banks is showing signs of recession. Mortgage would be another. The asset management business is tough. So, uh, but if there's tremendous strength, so you've got the regional banks that are primarily spread dependent, uh, they're seeing ROEs improve because of this, this strong revenue growth. And it's all about, too, operating leverage. We think that operating leverage, which is revenue growth versus expense growth, is probably going to be stronger than it was in the 2018 cycle. So that's a lot of wind in your sails, which is a good thing. But I think the clouds on the horizon that Betsy mentioned are, um, are really important, because and, and Ryan, because we shouldn't be surprised when credit costs go up. I'm more surprised that it hasn't happened already how long credit costs have been essentially zero. You could argue the industry's been over-earning on credit for some time. So there's got to be a little bit of a catch-up, but there are lots of nuances around that. The other thing is the shadow banking industry was never as big as it is today. The best thing that happened to shadow banks was zero interest rates. It was the rocket fuel for their growth. And, and, and uh, we, we look at many of the markets where shadow banking market share is bigger than the banks. So that'll be uh, something that'll be different uh, this time. 
But I would like to speak about deposits real quickly. At the end of 2019, there were roughly 13 trillion deposits in FDIC institutions. Today, there's 18 trillion. If you had applied a traditional growth rate during the COVID period, I think you can argue that there's $3 trillion of excess deposits that are sloshing around. And Ryan mentioned um, online banks, the money market funds, especially following the money market reform post Dodd-Frank, which now make them safer, are really good competitors for the banks. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how we get into this period where deposits are gonna lead the industry. So I think what's gonna mark a good bank is which banks can navigate that the best. JP Morgan has said that they think plus or minus $400 billion of their more expensive deposits may leave in the next 12 months. That would be the eighth largest bank in America. Like, these are big moving pieces, credit, deposit costs going forward, as well as while we're in a great revenue environment for banks, it's also gonna end. And I think like Ryan and Betsy said, all this is involved in the calculus. The bank stocks are not near their highs. They're closer to their lows. They bounced off the bottom, but I think investors believe that there could be a delta ahead of us. And I think the next six to nine months are gonna give us a really good indication about where we're going and how hard we're gonna go there. So that moves back to the issue, well, actually several issues, right? So there's a, there's a lot to unpack in this conversation. Um, but, you know, that is, we move back, so range of outcomes, valuations, what should banks be doing? Uh, you know, what are they doing? Are they doing it right to anticipate these, these situations along with some of the other factors that are out there? Maybe let's, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let, let you choose who wants to talk, but maybe Ryan or Betsy or others wanna pick up on some of those themes and see where we, uh, what our thoughts are. Well, I went first last time, so you're up. <coughs> Sure, so, you know, look, I, 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 maybe I'll start with, you know, valuation and, <coughs> and, and we, we can come, you know, we can come back to some of the other topics. Um, you know, look, I, I think we're in a really tough spot right now, you know, to, you know, to the points that, that Tom said in that, you know, I, I keep talking about this range of outcomes, but, you know, the, the market sniffed out really early that, you know, as I said, clouds were on the horizon and, you know, well, everything looks, you know, great for, you know, the back half of 22 and maybe into early 23. I, I, you know, I completely agree with what Tom said that, you know, you look out six to nine months and things start to become trickier. And I, I, I think, you know, and if you break down some of the things we talked about, so there's been outstanding loan growth across the industry. I think there's an investor view out there right now that, you know, a lot of this is, you know, a catch up from the pandemic. It's industry, you know, it's, it's, restocking of inventories across the industry. But I think there's a real question, where does the next leg of this come from? I think that's a question across you know, a variety of, of different outcomes. I think too, um, you know, Tom mentioned returns, right? Well, we, we, we've estimated returns oh, could reach 20% this year. Now, there's a little bit of trickery in the calculus, right? Because we had Cecil that came into play which made it harder to just look at the income statement because as we all know, banks lost money during the pandemic because we had to go adjust our economic models and you know, then we ended up releasing a lot of it. And then two, as you know, Betsy talked about, capital has become a little bit more sparse right now because the banking industry saw about a 20% hit to tangible book value because we saw short-term interest rates rise. Now, you know, I'm of the mindset that you know, inevitably, if you know, it, you, you know it's, it's a bit of a chicken or the egg in that if interest rates rise, book values will deteriorate, but earnings will go up. But on the flip side, if we end up seeing move into a downturn, we will recoup that capital in a really fast fashion. I don't think that the market is, is paying too close of attention to that. So when, when I think about where we are right now, the market is clearly grappling with that, you know, while return, everything looks rosy today, returns are going to reach peak levels, when we look out six, 12, 18 months, we're probably gonna be in a much more precarious position. So I think all the market is doing is saying, you know, we're gonna effectively look beyond part of this cycle. And you know, if you think about it, you know, bank, as, I, as I said before, banks today trade around two times tangible, but we're not making any of those adjustments that I just talked about. It's probably closer to one six. And you know, so we would expect to be much higher for where the returns are. So 
I just think we're going to unfortunately need to wait and see, and I think we're going to have a much better picture of this as we look out six to nine months. Let me, if I might, focus on this uh, current environment from a different perspective, and that is the perspective of um, you know, a technological revolution that's going on at a time when banks have money uh, and, and where banks have really done a marvelous job of coming back in 2007. In fact, bank, actually, the banking industry ought to be more celebratory, as, as should regulators, in terms of where we are today. And so what do we do with this, you might say, peace dividend? Uh, modernize. Uh, modernize on the one hand and avoid uh, the regulators uh, squeezing down on the banking industry too hard while the non-banking industry is getting away with murder. I mean, the, the one big issue that the banks face, I think, going forward and this is a wonderful opportunity to deal with it because banks are doing well, is, uh, is the non-banks who have essentially no regulation. They caused the last crisis, though it's called a banking crisis, which is a, a terrible anomaly. And I predict will get us into the next financial crisis if we don't do something about it. Meantime, you know, we've got limitations on acquisitions, we've got limitations on this, and the regulators themselves ought to be declaring victory, not, not basically going down the same road and making it tougher on the banks and without doing anything. So what should banks do? In my view, this is a wonderful time to modernize. And of course, look, I, where you stand is where you sit. As a, uh, a managing director of Canopy, a venture capital fintech investment company, I think the largest in the country, we, um, we're really taking advantage of ourselves uh, a time in history where uh, the, regula the uh, regulatory environment is somewhat benign towards technological change. Uh, the technology companies have figured out that they shouldn't be the bank's enemy. They ought to basically partner with the banks. That's the best way to make money. And for banks, this is a golden opportunity to modernize. If banks don't take advantage of this time, we're going to be in a mess because the world, as everybody in the audience knows, is changing dramatically. And as as, uh, as Greg said at the beginning, in terms of uh, using his payments. Uh, or the, the other thing I'd say in terms of this sort of what I'll call golden age for a short period of time, is I think there is a huge danger that if the Fed gets into crypto uh, and begins to take uh, a, you know, sort of the deposit experience away from the banking industry into the government, we're going to have all kinds of problems that we really haven't dimensioned for. Uh, uh, what ought to be happening here is, in fact, uh, the banking system ought to be used as the crypto, uh, safe crypto distri distributor payment system operation, as some banks are doing not basically making this a government activity. Uh, so bottom line, this is a seminal time for banking to really get ahead of the curve and retake turf, uh, as opposed to let that turf uh, uh, devolve away. Chief, just a question on that. When you're talking about crypto and the US government, you're talking about the US government take, having a di facing directly depositors through a digital currency. Right. I, I, I'm sympathetic. Uh, the federal government doesn't want uh, basically unknown, third, uh, unregulated third parties basically creating their own currency that takes away seniorage, takes away control, etc. So I'm sympathetic to the central banks around the world that are concerned about this. But the solution is not to basically become a bank and basically take the banking system away from the private sector. The solution is allowing the banks in the controlled circumstance basically to play more aggressively in the crypto market. And the tendency right now is to do the opposite. Somehow it, it's going to be safe for the Fed to do this, but it's not safe for the banks to get involved. Big mistake. And this, this I think, is, ought to be a, a, a policy area for uh, uh, policymakers in the private sector to really focus on. I, I couldn't agree more. And I know even when you look at the program of this conference, there's going to be a lot of discussion about that. My sense, I couldn't agree with you more, Gene, on this, but my sense is innovation has probably never been as far out in front of regulation as it is right now. 
And I think we're going to go through a period where that's probably going to catch up. And how it catches up is really important. And I even think about, just to give an example, in the second quarter when the beginning of the crypto winter started, um, we had some non-banks that had some very bad financial accidents. There are some banks who are beginning to be involved in the, in the ecosystem of cryptocurrency. And while they may have shrunk a little bit in the quarter, there was no financial damage to these balance sheets. And you can see how a bank with decades of practice of running a regulated institution can manage that risk. And then you can see what an institution that's not regulated, how they manage the risk. And so I would encourage the, the government bodies who are writing these policies, just take a look at what happened in the second quarter while this should all be inside, this should be inside the banking industry more because all the, the features and the framework has all, have already been built in the culture and the customs. I think it'd be, to stand up new industries at this point could be dangerous. Well, and, and people forget that in, from 1863 on until the Federal Reserve, Reserve of 1913, banks issued the currency. That is, the, 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 the note looked the same as it does today, the paper currency, but it had bank names on it. And it was authorized to be issued by the federal government through the national banking system. That's how the national banking system got started. There were two acts, the National Bank Act and the National Currency Act. And it, and, it, and it worked splendidly well, actually. We, it's, there's, there's an analogy here to, to how one might evolve into crypto. But boy, it shouldn't be taken over by the central bank. Yeah, I think on the crypto point, it sort of ties together with the first part of the discussion, which is you know, banks are looking for growth, just as every other industry, you know, companies look for growth, and crypto and fintech has been a potential avenue for that. But I think it's important to define what we mean by crypto. I guess the way I think about it, you've got services, you've got a currency, a coin, um, and then you've got a ledger. I think there's more runway in the banking system for the ledger. Um, the services, custody, lending against assets, something banks know how to do quite well, to you know, your points, that uh, who's better at, at that than banks that have done this in other asset classes. Uh, we're seeing a lot of pressure, though, on banks that are doing that from the regulators today. And I think the coin argument is, is the most tricky and fraught with peril. I think the regulators have really tapped the brakes. We've seen all three agencies basically say, if you're thinking about thinking about crypto, come talk to us first. And I think what that means is you better come to them with the most comprehensive thought piece on risk assessment that you've ever done in your organization's history to enter into anything that has to do with coin. Um, and to Gene's point, you know, banks uh, did issue coin, but is it gonna be uh, one that can talk to other banks or is it gonna be you know, one ecosystem issuing a coin that can only deal with one ledger or is it going to be able to travel uh, across? So I think, um, I think coin is the area where uh, a lot of issues have to be worked out, and I don't see a lot of running room for algorithmic coins in, uh, in the regulated space anytime soon. It, just to follow up on something you see, uh, <coughs> say multiple of main points, so, so credit lending, right? Banks are great at that, but you, know, you gotta know what you're lending against. Um, and it, struck, it strikes me that your division into three categories is right on, but you know, is it really so clear the distinction between the third and the second? I, I, think, I think you're right, They're, they can blur, and I think you have to be very tactical about what you wanna do as a bank in crypto. You have to risk manage it, understand it, um, because if you're trying to do too many things, you may not be able to be successful and uh, your growth plans can go to zero pretty quickly with regulatory pressure. So uh, it, it is a growth area, it's exciting. Um, I think the digital ledger can ring out inefficiencies, it can speed uh, you know, transfer of payments, uh, but, it, but it can also get you in trouble in all sorts of areas, whether it's uh, you know, BSA risk, it's consumer compliance, it's operational risk, um, smart contracts have their own governance issues that are hard to control and regulators can't do anything about it. So I think there's as much concern about uh, far-reaching efforts in crypto in the regulatory space as, as much as anything 
in their minds these days. For, 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 for banks, for good or ill, it is what it is. Getting ahead of the curve and sitting down with the regulators with a real plan as to what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, how we're going to risk manage, manage it. And I've seen uh, a number of banks that have done that very successfully with their regulators in the crypto space. Um, uh, indeed, one ought to be doing that in the, all the technological major changes that a bank is making or ingesting. And the vendor management rules, one in essence, does that. Anyway, so, but that's, that, that's the nature of being a regulated bank. It shouldn't stop us from letting the private sector, the banking industry, innovate with these new products in ways that will really benefit the public uh, and benefit the system. And if we're going to allow crypto at all, the banking industry is the right place to do it because it is regulated, because it has to go through the drill. And that's exactly what you said, Tom, as opposed to keeping it out. You either let government handle it or let the pirates handle it. The only thing I would add to that is, <laughs> well, no, <I'm> <laughs> you know, from a markets perspective, I do think there's a lot of investor education that needs to happen in this space. And, you know, it, it, if you think about it, you know, this is obviously a very volatile asset class, and, and your point about two or three, I think investors in general have, got, have been able to get comfortable with the custody of assets, the, the, the taking in of deposits. I think the lending side of the equation is still a part where the investor community still doesn't fully grapple with all the risks that are associated with this. And, you know, I, I think, you know, if you look, you know, there's a handful of institutions that are out there, you know, small and medium size where, you know, their, their stock prices have been really highly correlated to the movements in the price of Bitcoin. And I'm sure for anybody in the room who's, 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 a, who's a corporate leader or CEO, you know, it's probably the last thing that you're going to want to see happen. So my, my view would be, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said on the panel. You want to make sure as you're getting into the different areas, you're able to, to whether you want to say silo them or, or just separate them because the lending piece is really the part of the market that I still think that investors don't really have their arms around. I, I think there are two things that, that are important. One is, um, I wondered what was going to happen as the impact of COVID slowed down, if any of this energy around digitization was going to slow. It has not at all. But amongst the bank managers that I, that I meet with, they are as engaged or more so now. And there's a fear that something's going to happen, and they're going to find out they've been disintermediated. And the fear is that it's already essentially happened in the consumer business. I mean, we all kind of know who the national leaders are in that. Look at how many mortgages regional banks have today relative to the market. So banks don't want that to happen to them in the middle market commercial banking business. And so I see them spending a tremendous amount of time on FinTech in that arena specifically to make sure they don't get disintermediated. I think that, that's number one. The second is I just keep hearing more about blockchain, and I also believe that a lot of participants think that who controls payments is gonna be very important, and that payments may be at the top of the pyramid for FinTech, and, I, and I, it wasn't long in today's introduction that we heard about real-time payments. A lot of focus on that, and making sure, again, banks don't wish to be disintermediated, so they're paying attention to the whole landscape, in my opinion. And, and it's a wonderful time to do it. We really do have a window right now, because in nine months, who knows? We don't know where interest rates are going. I, I have to make a confident prediction as to where the economy is going. And the confident prediction is nobody until you know what the war is going to do in Ukraine to make a prediction that's worth anything. <laughs> because right, oil prices could go through the ceiling. We could have all kinds of things come out of this ugly situation in the Ukraine that are really destabilizing. Can't make a prediction. But for now, we're in a position where you know the market has gone down in the fintech space. Banks are in a strong position to invest and ingest. Uh, I think there is a regulatory um, understanding of that's important for banks to modernize. Uh, and if we don't take advantage of this period, uh, I think we're going to rue the day because uh, these young people, and I see it every day, people come into Canopy that they have phenomenal ideas and energy, and, and, and they're coming in with ideas that can help the banks. But if the banks are closing themselves off to these ideas, they're going to go off and do something else as they start out doing originally and disintermediate the banking system, which is a tragedy for America. Yeah, Gina, I think your piece on 
did it as a good analogy, and I totally agree now is the time for banks to invest in technology to make themselves better and more efficient. I think we should give banks uh, a lot of credit too, because in the last few years it's been hard seeing fintech competitors get these lofty valuations and aggregate customers in the, some tens of millions. It's the, the customer aggregation at some of these fintechs has been stunning. The question is, can they monetize them? And I think the economic environment and the rate cycle is a headwind for a lot of those fintechs where the banks know how to make money, they know how to risk manage, and if they can now apply some of that technological advantage, um, you know, their patience and diligence of not chasing customer aggregation uh, without thinking about Okay, now is the time to do it. Just right. like what happened in the dot-com bus. You had a dot-com bus, and let's analogize it to the current technological bus or whatever you call the valuation of these things, and, get, and what comes out of it? Apple, Google, Amazon. Amazon, and, and these, these entities, as we all know, are potential threats to the banking system. If, if they get the ability to basically take deposits, uh, Amazon could soak this up like a like a, a, a sponge, and um, so now's the time to basically put one in, uh, in a position and not assume that they're they're down for the count because they're not down for the count. But a lot of what you're highlighting here too is such a function of regulation, and if you are going to be regulating the banking system in a way um, that you know protects the system, you need to extrapolate that to the entire set of players who are involved in that space. So I know we were talking a little bit earlier about shadow banks and where are we with shadow banking systems. Shadow banking systems have been alive and well since the beginning of the country, <laughs> right? Um, and you know, it really is a, a question of do you want to have a level playing field and have your most um, you know, regulated industry be on that level playing field or off? And, and if you don't have a level playing field, then you are effectively uh, reducing your ability to influence the economy. That's it, and, and it's a wonderful time in that regard. The level playing field, I, I think, is just the, exactly the way we ought to be articulating it. And Chairman Powell, to his great credit, has said publicly, same activity, same regulation. That's the standard he's articulated, which I couldn't agree with more. And now that the, he said it, the Fed said it, let's drive that train that way with some vigor uh, because uh, I agree, without a level playing field, we're going to be disintermediate. It, it, it's happening. And the other thing, too, on this conversation, I'd take a step back and I'd look globally. If you look around the world, I mean, many of the European banks traded a third the valuation on a price to pay for a book as the U.S. banks. And they really have not recovered since the global financial crisis. A lot of them don't earn their, their cost of capital. And if, and the U.S. has an opportunity to really drive a good path for the industry that's the most profitable industry in all the major economies in the world of the banks, of the banking industry around the world. So I think you want to build on it and, and not disintermediate it. It's a global leader, and, and it's an industry where the United States is a global leader. Well, a number of these things, you know, I agree. But, you know, a, a, a lot of this isn't just up to the regulators, right? There are statutory frameworks, like the same activity, same regulation is easier said than achieved. Um, but there's, there are lots of, you know, so look at leverage lending, right? Leverage lending in, in a bank is regulated, outside a bank is generally not regulated. But the largest players in the, in the space are now not banks. Um, you know, so there, there's, there, there, there are political elements to it. There's congressional action that might be required to achieve certain results. Some of it is actually being the opposite, you're arguing. It's not really the same activity, same regulation, bringing everyone toward the bank standard. But maybe you're actually arguing the other way around. I think it's a bit of both. I, I, nobody can basically buy a home, get a mortgage, look at the pile of paper one's given, and say that the regulation are doing their job, right? You get a pile of paper that I'll bet every one of this town is thrown <laughs> in the garbage like me, has not read one thing, and that's supposed to be protecting us. That, that, that's emblematic of what we see, all of us in the banking industry, of regulations that are so dense and so complex and you need a, you know, a, 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 a seeing eye dog to get through it or something. And 
the, um, that, that, that shouldn't be. And I think that Congress would be open to some sensible approaches to regulatory change that are not deregulation. Some people in Congress are quite against that term. Uh, but, and God knows we don't need more regulation, but make it sensible, more sensible for banks. But on the other hand, we just can't allow, and the Fed ought to be more explicit about this even than they've been, that we can't allow people doing the same thing that banks are doing with the same risks to the public, the same systemic risks, at a time that we know that they put, give them the federal safety net they did during the pandemic, right? We guarantee junk bonds. So we've really got to do this, I think, and now's the time to do it, because otherwise uh, we're going to be disintermediated, and the next crisis will still call a banking crisis. So these, the, the, I, I get all that, right? These issues have been around for a very long time. We probably dis discussed this 10 years ago on this panel, although I wasn't on the panel 10 years ago, but I don't know, seven or eight years ago. You know, so what's, what's the thing now? Is it, is it the digital net, uh, you know, nature of everything that happens, that it happens in a, in a, in a different way. What spurs uh, change today that hasn't spurred it for the last decade? Well, banks are in better shape. They've proven that you get hugely well capitalized, uh, very heavily regulated, so a very strong position. We've seen some very ugly non-bank cases, the case of the the crypto meltdown in one case. Another one is there's some mortgage company in Philadelphia, I'm forgetting the name, I think it's Trident, that basically is engaged, has been engaged, it's just fine by the, by the CFPB, for engaging in redlining activity that is, would, would make their hair curl in the 1940s with all kinds of scurrilous emails and racial slurs and, 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 and redlining, of course, outside the banking industry. So there are examples of where the lack of regulation for non-banks has created pernicious results for the public, and on the other hand, how banks are over-regulated. And I, I think we don't take up this mantra and do it now, we're not gonna have a better chance. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that I would add is, as a bank analyst, we always think about things you know, in terms of you know, funding, liquidity, and capital, right? And I can think back to a year ago, every investor on the planet was asking Betsy and I if buy now, pay later is going to take over the world and what is it gonna mean for the general banking industry and, and for all the consumer finance lenders and both also cover consumer finance. And you know, the, the one thing I would say is without getting into a, a major discussion point on regulation, there's clearly some loopholes that are out there that at a minimum have opened up the doors to allow a lot of these non-banks to gain access to these. And I don't think we're gonna see, you know, 65% of residential mortgages go from the non-banking industry back to the traditional banking industry. There's just been too many structural changes that have happened that are unlikely to be unwound. But that doesn't mean that there can't be lots of different loopholes, access to funding and the like, that have really opened the doors to a lot of these different institutions that have put them in a position to disengage. That's true. So, so let's come at this from a different take take it take as granted that banks should take this opportunity to modernize, right? So what are the things they should be doing and with whom? Whom are they partnering with? And are the tech firms, uh, you know, what, what do they bring to the table for the banks or should the banks be going alone? It's, it's very hard, Mitch, to go alone entirely. Obviously, there's certain areas in which banks want to do things for themselves to have the capital as it's going to do it, but it's very hard. Why? Because a number of the changes are best shared. You're not going to re you're not going to invent some of the areas that basically you get the savings to scale if you're doing the same thing across a whole bunch of banks, uh, as opposed to inventing it all yourself. The other thing is, frankly, the technological area, as we all know, is given to a certain level of genius and innovation, and all of it is never invented in your own company, however good your own company is. And uh, now with this opportunity to uh, share these innovations by the uh, you know, tech sector uh, to these small new companies, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. And the regulators have been quite good about this, I think, in allowing banks monitoring it carefully, worrying about the vendor rules, of course, but uh, to uh, ingest new technologies through these new innovating companies. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that is the fundamentally the way to go, certainly for um, 
large and mid-sized all the way down to smaller institutions. For the largest institutions for land, maybe you can make the case that they should do much more internally, but even there, as you can see in terms of what they themselves ingested, it's very hard to have all things in bank here. I, I think the relationship with banks in their core is evolving, is my sense. And I think what's happened is banks have gotten better at developing gateways that allow them to launch these fintech services into their bank at a faster pace than they had. And they're not entirely relying on their cores to do it. So I think as these new partners get stood up and the efficiency of doing it, and, um, and you know, I'm aware of one hundred, well, I'll, I'll say it differently, because it, it was a press release, you know, First Republic put out a very public press release about the upgrade of their core. You can find it earlier this year. And as that's, you know, watching a bank like that evolve their core, and then what I think they're planning on doing on top of that with the new FinTech partners that they have, it could be actually quite exciting as to how they operate the bank and then how they have to take friction out of their client relationships. So I, I, I think that evolution is happening. And I think if we come back in 10 years and talk about what, what role the, the core processors are playing, I think it could be very different than what it is today. And I think these partners that are coming on top of them may have greater savings. I, I, I would also add to, to Tom's point, like in addition to the core, you know, look, you know, there is good innovation happening outside the banking industry, right? I think we all recognize that. And there, there's no reason why, you know, banks cannot use their currency and liquidity and capital to be acquirers of these businesses. We've seen it, you know, a handful of times here, you know, particularly over the last, let's call it, you know, one to two years where we've seen various businesses, both on the commercial and the consumer side, Banks have gone out and you know they, they, they've acquired these and they've, and they've integrated them. And if you think about it, I think you, know, you said before, a lot of these things have been in the business of acquiring customers and then they can't figure out how to monetize them and bring them a full service product. You know, one thing I think we all agree on is that you know, banks do have a lot of products and they do have a lot of customers. So I think this is something we're probably gonna see a lot more of banks going out and you know, building out different verticals that, you know, that they could be partners with FinTech and continuing to acquire. And, and I think we're going to see a great deal more shared services. I think the shared services mm -hmm. uh, uh, mantra is really where there's ex excitement, there's opportunity. We, we see at Canopy five companies a week, ten companies a week, that are developing innovative, creative ideas. Now, some of them you would invest in, and some of them are not ready to be used. But of those people all over the United States, those young people who are inventing new, it's remarkable. There's one company that we've got involved with, super, super company of all places, Chattanooga, Tennessee. You wouldn't expect it. You know, you expect Silicon Valley, not Chattanooga, Tennessee. I hope I'm not hurting feelings <laughs> here. There's somebody from Chattanooga. But the, uh, the, it, the shared services opportunities, I think, is a really new and great direction for the bank industry. So, Mitch, to your question on technology, I think it, for me, it depends on what we mean by that. We, using technology to make yourself better and more efficient, um, partnering with those companies, really important. I think the biggest flashing warning sign in that area, though, is technological innovation that tries to boil the ocean and change the firm uh, in a wholesale way. I think that's where even, even large, sophisticated banks, when they take on too big of a project, can get bogged down in years long of uh, issues. So I think being tactical about what you're trying to do and assuming the technology um, in a targeted way is important. And then I think using technology to grow through partnership uh, um, it's been a popular way to grow revenue, grow profit margins. You know, we already have the back office. We're in this part of the country. We can now sell the you know, 48 or 50 states. Isn't that great? Um, and that's worked for some firms, but it's also created uh, some issues where reputational risk has sort of outkicked the coverage, if you will. And uh, we're starting to see some actions by the regulators on that partnering model to grow. Uh, that's not as prevalent in the largest banks, but it, it's happening in, in mid-sized and smaller banks. And so I think the partnership model has to be evaluated carefully. 
So it's interesting from my perspective just to layer on, you've got so much opportunity with partners, you've got so much opportunity with new technologies that are being created on a daily basis. The question then is how are you organized to capture that? And how are your front, off, your client facing, I guess they would say, your process folks, your risk folks, how well are they integrated with each other so that you can unearth the frictions before it becomes um, a line on the chart, before it becomes you know, a part of your histogram? Um, and how do you unearth those frictions and address them and fix them um, in a way that drives client, client acquisition? I know it's, uh, it's a lot of, of different pieces that I'm highlighting here, but how you're organized I think will differentiate who is able to thrive in this uh, faster than who's uh, falling a little bit behind. Betsy, that's really well said. And, and one thing I think banks have done remarkably well is uh, get on top of these vendor management rules, which are very complex, which of course is you know, a real safety valve for these new companies and the relationship banks have with them. There's, there's nobody we invest in or get involved in a new tech company that we don't look at from a safety and soundness and regulatory compliance perspective. And no bank should, and no bank really does. But you're, you're really right to emphasize that. The banks are organized for it. So how do we adjust new technology safely? I think have a leg up. But I think Betsy even is arguing for a, for a model that goes beyond right, treating your tech vendor as a vendor. Right, and, and integrating, you know, in effect, and you use the word integrating, right. right? Which, you know, there are gonna be cases where that's clearly what you want because everyone brings something, you know, we bring the customer, you bring the, all the, you know, all the machinery, et cetera, et cetera, and you need, to, you need to put it all together. It's very hard, I think, for both the banks and the tech firms today, with all the pressure there is to move, to really, you know, there's, there's, it's a little cart and horse problem in many in many trends. We I see it time and time again, right? That 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 integrative thinking really only occurs once the deal has been done, and I think that runs risks because the regulators see only the aftermath of the problem happens, and problems happen frequently. So it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting puzzle. I, I, I would say that I, I think everything you've said, I, I agree with, but I don't, I don't think that the problems, and I don't think there are actually very many of them, outweigh yeah. the benefits. And uh, uh, indeed, I would say that at least in our experience, the problems have been remarkably few compared to the benefits obtained. And, um, I, I, and, and I think both the tech companies and Banks are getting better and better and better at, um, at looking uh, at these new opportunities with, with care. Uh, but they've got, got to take advantage of it, must take advantage of it, because otherwise anything that is truly transformation will be adopted outside the banking industry for the banking industry. As, as you said, the mortgage area. The mortgage space is a very good analogy of a core product that never should be taken away. I will just highlight that um, when you think about what drives bank stock alpha, it's positive surprises in return on equity, positive surprises in operating leverage. So the investment spend needs to happen to drive that you know, customer flow and that revenue growth, but try to do it in a way that delivers positive operating leverage because that's what's really going to resonate with investors. What's also nice that's happening too is as we kind of go into this growth winter, in addition to the crypto, growth <laughs> 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 um, yeah, summer. summer. Uh, uh, but in any case, is that the valuation, the cost of capital advantage was so extreme during COVID for these growth companies. Uh, that's now normalized a bunch. So, and, and the focus is getting back towards profitability that, that I know was said earlier. And that's coming back to banks' way, way versus some of these, not all, but it, to a large degree it happens. So among other things, you see that fueling more M&A and less partnership activity in the I think partnership activity is going to remain extraordinarily high. Um, one of the things in M&A to think about is you are what you eat. And there are, uh, there you could acquire one of these. I think banks will move carefully 
on making outright acquisitions. I could see them making acquisitions for deposit gathering uh, software or, or platforms or mechanisms, but, uh, but I think they're going to be cautious. I think there'll be more JVs than outright acquisitions. I don't know if the rest yeah, of the I was, I was going to say, you know, just to ex extend on, on Tom's point, I completely yeah. agree. I think we're in a, a very tricky time to be doing traditional bank acquisitions, right? Just given the fact that, you know, if you think about the theme of, of the panel, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. The, the, the picture looks clear, you know, whether we're talking about winter or summer for the next, you know, call it six to nine months. But, you know, I, I, it's a great phrase that, you, that Tom used, like inevitably there's been so many distortions because of COVID, credit performance has been so pristine and, you know, it just feels like there's still too many things to really understand what you're getting. Plus the fact that, you know, we talked about disintermediation and digital and, you know, buying a, a retail network today, and, you know, he, he talked about, you know, big tech and how they're acquiring customers and, and the potential to, to, to really take parts of the business, you know, particularly on the medium to large, larger size institutions, there's definitely instances where it makes sense to do. I just don't know how much, you know, buying yesterday's distribution strategy is really, you know, is really what the market is looking for. We're in, we're in our closing time, so I, we have lots of, we have, we're only part way through our, our outline. Um, our ambitions uh, were, were, were high, but um, we, we promised people they would have a chance to ask questions, and now through the, mod, uh, the magic of modern technology, uh, BPI has taken this opportunity to modernize. Um, uh, we have some questions. So Gene, this is specifically directed at you. You commented about the market share growth by unregulated non-banks. You, you did, in fact, do so, and the risks they pose to the system. And uh, you're invited to elaborate on what risks you are most worried about uh, and the biggest regulatory gaps. I actually, while that's directed at you, and I made it certainly that way, I think there are, there, that, that's a fair question for a number of people on this panel. Well, uh, you, you, you have a plethora of opportunities here. Whoever asked the question, thank you. <laughs> the, let, let's take leverage. I knew it. Let's, let's take leverage. <laughs> so, leverage lending used to be the home for banks. This was a right. This was a bank product. Most leverage lending is now outside of banks. And what we've got is a pernicious situation where the terms that are currently being offered by non-bank leverage lenders are very aggressive and drive the banks in the wrong direction, actually, right? Because it's hard to compete. So the banks are being driven in the wrong direction, and they're having to compete with people of no regulation, you know, no uh, uh, equivalent capital requirements, no this, no that, uh, which means it's very hard to operate a, prep, a profitable business in an area that's a core bank uh, area. You, 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 you mentioned mortgage, another example of where I can tell you with certainty that the standards that uh, uh, mortgage lenders that are not banks meet as a practical matter are dramatically lower in terms of consumer protection than the standards that banks meet. Banks meet. And, they, and of course, the bank standards cost money. And banks are careful about this, and, and, as they should be. It, that's outrageous to basically disintermediate the banking system and a poor product because we're allowing somebody basically to take advantage of the consumer, as you can see in the Trident case, is insane. Uh, this, uh, and, and if we allow this to continue, you know, the country will be losers. It's not just the banks. It, it, it's the, the country will be poor for it, and there will be a blow up. Now, I know you all have things to say about that, but like I said, we promised people they would get to ask questions, so I'm going to ask the other the other two questions. How much capital stress is, quote, just, close quote, driven by numerical impact of mark to market debt securities and bank portfolios and related impact on OCI? And is that likely to resolve itself without banks de risking? Oh, I knew it. Go right ahead. I'll let you <laughs> I would say it is in part OCI, but don't forget the swelling of the deposit base. So when you look at like tangible common equity to assets, for example, that includes the three trillion dollars that we believe is in the system. So the leverage, you know, the, you got to look at equity to loans as well, I believe, 
uh, for example, because capital looks thin because of the marked market on the bond portfolios, but also because I think of the swelling that's going to ease over time. Yeah, the one thing I would add is, you know, similar to Tom on our work, we said about two and a half trillion dollars of, of excess deposits, you know, likely sitting in the system. I think from a market's perspective, you know, one of the concerns is, well, up until this point, it's been driven by the fact that it's been mostly marked to market because of interest rates. I think the bigger question is, and Tom touched on earlier in the presentation, I think the general view is that, you know, with QT taking hold and reaching, reaching its peak, we're likely to see further outflows across the industry. And the question becomes, will a lot of these losses inevitably have to be crystallized as bank looks, banks look for ways to support their customers and fund their balance sheets? And I think that, while we haven't seen much of that yet, I think that's still the bigger risk to the industry overall. And the only two things I'd add there are that how many people in the room have 100% certainty in their 10-year yield forecast? <laughs> I don't think anybody does, right? So how confident are you that you've seen the end of the marked market hits? Um, and I, I understand, you know, once it's over, you can earn it back, no big deal. We didn't put the earn back in our models. But my confidence in my tenure yield forecast is not even close to 100%. By the way, should I, I know I've beaten this horse to death. <laughs> But I can't help but also the way the bloody flag that hopefully will get you know, the bankers in the audience to their feet with anger. <laughs> so we need to solve this level playing field problem. We're going through a, a new CRA uh, set of regulations. Depending on how you count, I count it as 835 pages of complex regulations. None of these regulations, none of the civic responsibility, the banks have done a marvelous job. I might say it fulfilling, but not a single one applies to the non banks I pushed the wrong button, so the last question disappeared. But it was about <laughs> it was about <laughs> buy now, pay later, and its role in the whole discussion we had earlier about payments and the payment system. See, I, so so BPI modernized or TCH modernized. It's one or the other. Um, uh, but I didn't <laughs> properly. So buy now, pay later. So my, I'll do a quick comment. We, we write an annual report that updates our, our outlook in the industry. And there's a paragraph in the beginning that I don't let them take out, because it talks about banking when the Egyptians were ruling the planet. <laughs> and my view is that the principles of it haven't changed, which is have folks who can pay you back uh, on a timely basis and get paid back. It really has to change. We just do it a lot faster now. We use technology and other things. But the key principles of lending, it's really installment lending. I think buy now, pay later is installment lending. And it will all come down to the principles that determine success, which is credit quality, funding, and capital. That hasn't been changed. I don't, I, the people, the, the folks who drive lending at the big banks are very smart people with decades of culture. I'd be surprised if there was some underwriting technique that they had missed. In my view. You know, two, two quick things that we, we wrote a series in 2015 called The Future of Finance, where we looked at all these areas of disintermediation, and we went and met with all these companies, and they all came out and said, you know, we asked them, what is your point of differentiation, and they, you know, Tom Swain said, oh, it's underwriting, and, you know, needless to say, most of these companies don't exist anymore. You know, look, I, you know, I was, I, I was in a meeting with the CEO, and he referred to it as buy now, default later. And you know, inevitably, it's easy, as I've heard many CEOs say, it's easy to lend money. It's much harder to get repaid. I, I, I do think, though, from a payments perspective, from a customer acquisition perspective, you know, one thing you hear over and over is that fintechs, whether it's buy now, pay later, or something else, tend to do one or two things really well. But it, the, the key thing is, can they? you know, develop into something much broader. And I don't really, my personal view is, I don't really think buy now, pay later is that different. It's a really good customer acquisition tool. You kind of created a niche between kind of debit and credit, but inevitably Americans love rewards. And I mean, you know, I think that the American market is structurally different from a lot of places around the globe. And, you know, unless, you know, we were to have more regulation and interchange, which I know has been discussed, uh, I, I don't see it having a meaningful impact on the U.S. banking system to the way it has globally. Final thoughts? Anyone feels like they should unburden themselves? So, you know, we brought you right, we are right on time. 
So hopefully uh, I've, I've scored some points with my hosts. Um, and uh, I want to thank the panel. Uh, uh, you know, I, every year I worry that it's going to somehow not work out. It always does. And it's thanks to these people and the others who have sat in their chairs. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not an official break. Please remain in your seats while we reset the next portion of our program. This is not. An